Well, it's big and it's heavy. So I like it already. This is the Toshiba T6600C portable computer. Hello everyone, I'm High Treason and we're going to have a look at the T6600. It's a really big, heavy, portable machine. And by portable, I mean portable. No batteries. This isn't a laptop. In fact, I don't think you really want to put it on your lap. I mean, I don't care, but I can see why it might get uncomfortable after a while. Anyway, I don't have much else to say in this intro, so we'll just move on to that. The first thing you're going to notice is the sheer size of this thing. It's absolutely massive, certainly within the realms of a desktop computer, and it weighs about the same. Around 19 pounds, or 8 kilograms if you want to do it that way. So, looking at the outside of the unit, there's something we cannot ignore going on at the front here. It has a handle on it! And it's a very sturdy handle. I know I've talked about this before, but seriously, where the hell did this simple feature of convenience go? Laptops now, like this Elite Book, which isn't going to be around much longer with any luck, are big and bulky in their own right for different reasons. They've got slippery smooth surfaces all over them, and generally need two hands to carry safely. Which is crap if I want to take it to a car and go somewhere else with it, I'm probably going to drop it and it's going to break, or I need to buy a case for it, which I'm sure is the manufacturer's intention. But still, this could be negated by the installation of a handle like the one on the Toshiba here. I don't know how many times I have to iterate this. Of all the features I'd like to see come back on modern systems, this one ranks very highly. I think Panasonic still have them on their industrial laptops at least, and hey, even some kids' laptops have them too. And if you can put them on children's laptops, then you think it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to put it on a supposedly professional laptop, would you? But hey, you know, manufacturing constraints. I guess the technology just isn't good enough yet. At least that's what they tell me with display panels now, so I like assume it's the same with handles. I guess we've gone backwards, or maybe I come from the future and I fell through time. Who really knows at this point? That aside, the next thing that stands out is probably the speakers. I guess when you have to make a system this big to fit everything else inside, you may as well install speakers that are in proportion with the rest of it. It would seem they didn't cheap out on us here. You can control the volume of these speakers using the knob at the front. I suppose it's not the first time you've seen me playing with knobs on this channel. To the right of the unit is a floppy drive. I don't think it works, and believe it suffers from being belt driven, as Toshiba loved using such things in their portable systems at the end of the 80s and first half of the 1990s. The belts obviously wore out, and the drive stopped working. I don't know for certain in this case, due to having no working discs to test it with, and refuse to buy any more. Floppy disks suck. I'm sick of them. They don't last five minutes. I'd sooner just copy interlink byte by byte using my hands than use a disk ever again. They are absolutely terrible, they serve no purpose, and as stated, they seem to break after just one write. I don't know why, and I don't much care. And yeah, I did do that on this system. Please kill me. The CD-ROM drive isn't original, it's an NEC Multispin 6XI. We have seen it before, so I won't go into too much detail, but needless to say, yeah, this thing would work pretty much independently as long as it had power, and the LCD will tell you a lot about it. I think it's out of a, a caddy, so it was probably portable, I guess you could use it as a CD player. I mean, you really can, there's enough buttons and enough info on the screen for it to do that, so that's kind of neat. Usually a blank plate would be installed in this spot, which I do still have, unless you forked out for the T6600 CD, or else install the drive later, as is the case here. Beyond this, there is a fan, a power switch that's recessed so you're less likely to flip it into the off or on position by accident, and also there's this door. Like the T3200SX we looked at, this system has the ability to house regular ISA expansion cards. The birth slots in this one are 16-bit, so you can put full-on, full-size 16-bit cards in here, which is quite unusual. I don't see modern portable systems doing this. You could probably build your own now, I would think. The parts are cheaper and more abundant, and a lot smaller. 
Now this system came to me with this Ethernet card installed and also this Turken Ring card. A consequence of what this system was being used for and who owned it, but we'll get there later on, probably towards the end of this video. Currently there's nothing installed in the slots, that's probably going to change later, and yeah, I don't have any blanks for them unfortunately, but as I do plan to fill them up with something, I've not really bothered trying to find any to put in there in the meantime. It's not doing too much harm. To the left of the system there's another door, this time for upgrading the RAM. I don't have any of these RAM upgrade cards, so are limited to the base 8 megabytes that are built in. Or should that be megabytes? Which is enough for a 486DX266 in 1993. It would be nice to have 16 megabytes though. It seems unlikely any of these cards will be found, but that's not a big deal. There's another fan, and then another door. This one is for PCMCIA cards. You can lock this port up with this weird piece of metal. It actually doesn't seem that useful to me. That's one of the more oddball and clunky features of this thing, but, well, so be it. At least it's there. I'd rather have more features than I need than lose features that I want. There's also a Kensington lock hole to stop people stealing your portable system from your desk. Although it probably isn't going to be very portable anymore if you can't remove it from your office. That's enough of that. The back of the machine is far more interesting to me. Of course, there's a standard C13 power connector there. No messing around with weird cables, it just plugs into the mains with a really abundant type of cable. Naturally, this is a portable, so there's no battery power. Beside that is a flap, which folds down. Ooh, nice attention to detail, these little clips retain it out of the way in this little recess here. So you can still put the system down on its back with the door open, and just generally not have to worry about it getting broken off by accident. Now behind that panel there are PS2 ports for a keyboard and mouse if you want to use those. There's a VGA port which can be used at the same time as the internal LCD. One serial port and a parallel port, so pretty standard I.O. for the time. Below this there are audio connectors for a microphone, line input, line output and amplified output for passive speakers. Then the SCSI. Yeah, this thing actually has that. I could see that being useful for external drives, or maybe coupled with a MIDI controller card. You could just use a serial port if you were particularly resourceful. For controlling Akai samplers or something. You know, I guess this external SCSI almost came back in the form of eSATA on modern laptops, but it took long enough. It wasn't like we had EIDE on laptops before that. Uh, well, we're, actually we kind of did, because that means enhanced IDE. So yeah, that's not what EIDE meant. Shit! Who comes up with these names? But hey, still, seeing as we got external drive interfaces back, maybe we'll get handles back someday. Maybe in another 20 years when I'm about to die. That's fucking wonderful. What a nice thought. You know, that's... If that's the last thing I see on this planet, I can die happy. The top of the system is boring, and it also has text printed the wrong way, such that it will be upside down if the lid is open, which really annoys my selective OCD, because people walking by won't easily be able to see what you're using. They might have to turn their head upside down, and that's no good. I want them to know I'm using a T6600C, because this thing was probably quite expensive in its time. I don't even want to look it up, because my heart probably won't take it. And to be honest, that's kind of shit, because, well, I want to show off. I'm some guy in 1993, I'm a yuppie upstart, I run my own business, and how am I supposed to impress people if they don't know what machine I have? Well, I guess it's always an argument waiting to happen. Is this print really for someone facing the front of the machine with the lid down, or for somebody sitting behind it while you've got the lid open? Who really knows? Either way, you're never going to please everybody. It's a pretty good example of this fact, because it applies to almost everything you do in life. The bottom of the system is quite boring as well. It's just the label, and also one of these rubber feet is missing. It would probably be possible to cut another one out of a sheet of adhesive rubber, I suppose. The remaining ones are still rubber, and, well, they're not goo, so that's good. The screen clips are standard fire for the time. Sprung sliders which move a hook on the each side. The hooks aren't so sharp as to cut your fingers if you knock into them as well. I've handled a few machines like that and it really hurts. The screen doesn't feel as though it has any damping springs to prevent it slamming closed though, so well, I'm going to say it doesn't have one, 
but it's possible it once did and mine is simply missing or worn out. The screen is quite large and it isn't LCD, though it's an active matrix TFT screen opposed to the older passive matrix designs. It has a contrast ratio of 60 to 1 and a maximum resolution of 640 by 480 with an 8-bit colour depth, basically 256 colours, though there are supposedly 256,000 possible colours it can display. I'm not sure whether the VGA system or the LCD driver circuitry is the limit for that, although the 8-bit colour limit is almost certainly due to the VGA hardware inside the system. <laughs> uh, I think we're blowing the spiders out. I haven't run this thing in a while. Still, this is a very vibrant and responsive panel. I'd say it rivals and in some cases even surpasses a lot of modern LCDs. It looks pretty good. I don't know what happened really because LCDs at this time, if you were willing to pay for them, weren't half bad. Whereas the quality of them just seemed to subside as we went into the 2000s. I guess that happens when things become more cheap and mass produced and we just never really recovered in some ways. Only now do we seem to be getting there on the response time in colour. It's a little bit late if you ask me, and I'm not going to buy an LCD monitor, I'm holding out for OLED. But still, back on the T6600, there would be little need to go farther than these colour depths and resolutions on a portable system at the time it was made. To be honest, it was still quite common to run desktops like this to save on CPU usage and sometimes memory usage. Resources came as something of a premium back then. You really did have to balance things out carefully. It's something of a lost art form that people don't think about so much now. The stator sleds beneath the screen are shaped just such that you can still see them if the screen is closed. The keyboard is removable, or at least you can move it away from the system. Of course, it's always going to be stuck on this wire. But I wouldn't mess with it too much because it can be a bit rough getting that wire back in. It's a coiled cable and it may have stretched due to age. Still, the keyboard is pretty full featured and it uses a familiar layout. It has arrow keys and a numeric keypad as well as pretty much everything else. Negating any need for that shifted FN key nonsense I can't be bothered with. And in case you're wondering about this keyboard, it's not too bad. It's it's one of those weird ones where I can't quite tell if it's rubber derm or mechanical. It, it sounds a little bit mechanical, it feels a little bit mechanical, but it probably isn't sort of thing. Like there's not enough of that spongy resistance in pushing the key down that you would get in a rubber derm keyboard usually. But it, it's not painfully clunky like a mechanical keyboard either, so I don't know what it is. Some weird middle ground I guess. Uh, I don't really want to pull the keycaps off without knowing how it works, it could break something. It's uh, It doesn't actually work right mine and occasionally it will fire a character twice when you press a key. It's a minor niggling problem that only shows up every so often and I'm slowly ironing such things out. There's a few things like that on this machine, it doesn't really concern me too much, I'll suss it out when it does annoy me to the point that I want to do something about it. But yeah, it's it's not a terrible keyboard, it's it's not uncomfortable to use, it's a decent layout and everything, so yeah. It's actually very similar to the uh, layout on a modern mobile workstation, I guess, like the Elite Books before they started getting rid of those ones with the numeric pad. Don't see those so much now, which is a shame, because I really like having things like that. But yeah, what are you going to do? That's how things work, everything's cost-cutting and finding ways to make things worse and get away with it basically that's that's the way things work now so yeah what are you gonna do inside there's nothing really all that spectacular i suppose although the integration on it's pretty nice in that they've really got it down to just one or two pcbs the cd-rom drive and also a two gigabyte scuzzy hard drive are obviously located inside the system neither of these drives are factory and the system can only address the fast one gigabyte of the hard drive, so that's probably going to be changed at some point, but as I said, SCSI hardware is quite expensive, so, well, until I stumble into a cheap one, I'm not in any rush. This thing will work fine for now. The original hard drive was a Connor IDE model. I do think Toshiba offered a SCSI model if you were willing to pay for it, 
But, well, that wasn't the case in here, obviously. I thought I'd finally found a Connor drive that actually worked, because I've never seen one before, and I've never been able to hear what they sound like. But, yeah, unfortunately, uh, well, it, whilst using the system, I noticed a very strong smell, like a capacitor was going to blow or some sort. It was just burning, that sort of, yeah, this is a really bad omen, uh, do something about it now kind of smell. Nothing ever went bang. I turned the system off and I searched everywhere for the source. I couldn't find it. Not even after going through the insides of the power supply extensively and I tested everything I could think of. It turned out that the smell was coming from this hard drive. So I cloned it and just left it to rot in a corner. I'm not going to start it up again because I don't know what it's going to do. It probably doesn't work by now. There's just no point. It's a nice display piece and nice to remember how this system started out I suppose. Oh, plus somebody's installed a rat, so yeah, I wouldn't trust it as far as I could throw it, that drive. At the back there are ISA slots. You can access these without removing the bottom panel, only needing the back panel to come off. Now you might notice that as well as IDE and SCSI in here, there is a feature connector for the VGA system in there. Toshiba even offered the use of a capture card with this system. That's rather unusual, and I don't think this option existed for long. And I don't have this option. None of my cards work in the right way to be useful in here either. So, well, we won't be installing one. Which is a bit of a shame, because I kind of would have liked to have seen that on a portable. It would have been quite novel, even if completely pointless. Most everything else is on the one motherboard. It's a portable machine, so obviously integration is the name of the game. Just stick everything to one board and have done with it. Everything, including the Western Digital 90C31 VGA chip, along with its 1 meg of video memory, is on this board, really. This VGA chip seems to be connected internally to the ISA bus, and not a local bus such as VLB, which is kind of unfortunate, I suppose, but, well, it shouldn't impact things that much on a system of this speed. It's just sort of on the edge of where you'll start really noticing, I guess, but, well... Yeah, for the things that you'd run on here, it's I don't think it's that big of a deal. I mean, it's a portable system. You, you can't really expect it to be high-end desktop levels. It's middle-of-the-road desktop levels is more what I would be expecting. So, well, it doesn't bother me. It does have a genuine Yamaha OPL3 chip, but that is, unfortunately, connected to a Microsoft Windows sound system which isn't all that useful for MS-DOS games and applications, because I can't get the Sound Blaster compatibility TSR to work, no matter how hard I try. It says it's worked, but it doesn't work. Seems to be an issue with DMA, uh, I really don't know for sure. I mean, I guess they didn't lie to us, it is the Microsoft Windows sound system after all, but uh, I have to say, it's kind of obvious to me now why this never really caught on. Surprisingly, the CPU is installed in a socket and not soldered to the motherboard. There's not much room for upgrades, but you might just be able to fit a DX4 overdrive in here. It would have to be the overdrive, because this socket is 5 volts, and the regular DX4 expects 3 volts, of course. I don't know that there'd be enough space to put one of those voltage-adapting interposers in here, if you could even find one. I mean, the overdrive chips are rare enough, and... Those little socket adapters are... Yeah, I, I don't fancy your chances. I wonder if you could put a Kingston Turbo chip in here. Overall, you'd probably do better just to leave it alone, and the DX2 is good enough. Well, I guess we should benchmark this system. A good comparison is likely the STPC client at 66 MHz, as that system doesn't have level 2 cache. The T6600C does have the option of level 2 cache, but I don't have that accessory, and I can't say how well it would work. I imagine it would yield faster results, you would think. I mean, it usually does on desktops, and why would this be any different? But, yes. 3D Bench does 25.9 versus 24.9 for the STPC, so the T6600 is a bit faster here. It's off to a good start. It is also faster in PC Player, 8.6 versus 6.8. Top bench sees the STPC pull ahead with 171 versus only 115 for the T6600C. Speed sys shows the Intel CPU is a little slower than the Cyrix Core, 21.34 versus 26.79. 
the T6600C has better memory bandwidth at 84 versus 54, slower level 1 cache at 34 versus 43. It's odd how the numbers keep mirroring like that. I swear I don't do it on purpose. The T6600C is marginally faster when it comes to memory throughput, 20 versus 19 megs per second. We can't measure the video memory speed. Hard drive, I can't be bothered to sit there. It's probably around 3 megs per second. It's not brilliant, but it's probably better than IDE of the time. In Doom, both systems manage around 14.5 frames per second. There's a little bit in it, but I can't be bothered to differentiate here. It doesn't really matter. It's just over 5,000 real ticks to finish the demo. We'll say 5,100 maybe. Quake does 6.3 frames a second here versus only 3.9 for the STPC. Although you wouldn't be playing that on a 486 at 66 megahertz, let's be honest. It may be worth noting the STPC was tested with the slower UMA video and no TSRs loaded. And no TSRs were loaded on either system to help anything. They never are. The STPC will go faster when it has a PCI video card installed. But in the real world, it probably won't pull that far ahead, say, when you're running a game or something. And, well, the Toshiba doesn't have PCI, so it wouldn't be a particularly fair comparison, which is why I used the slow UMA video to try and equalise it. And it seems to have worked. It seems this thing is well within the ballpark. It performs okay. Of course, if we put these both up against a VLB system, like my unusually fast 486SX40 they're going to fall behind quite quickly, because that thing is evil, and I like it. Overall, I'd say the T6600C had an average performance for a DX2, which is certainly usable and pretty powerful for 1993, especially, again, remembering that this is a portable system and not really a desktop. The DX4 wasn't out yet, and the Pentium probably wasn't worth having most of the time, if you could even afford it, so... Yeah, definitely, definitely good. I have no complaints about the performance on this thing. If it had been made just a few months later, I might have had, because things were moving quickly back then, and that's something you've got to remember. And you may be thinking, well, they could have put this, they could have put that, but you've got to remember, these things uh, would have been cost prohibitive already. I, you've got to draw a line somewhere. Game-wise, you're probably going to top out in the realms of Duke Nukem 3D, though with the Windows sound system being stubborn, there's no sound outside of the ad-lib music. These are even the factory drivers for the system, so yeah, it's not some OEM weirdness. I don't know why it won't work. Perhaps it never did, and as the TSR doesn't report a problem with the settings I'm using here, well, what am I supposed to do? Interestingly, this feature wasn't actually set up when I got the system, so you do have to wonder. In fact, you might notice something odd in the menu here. Yeah, this thing was a packet sniffer, and that's what those network cards were installed for. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get this to work. But no matter what happens, I do have an image of the drive. So if anything, it winds up broken, we can always take it back to where it was and try to play with it again. I honestly think this Ethernet card's broken, as I can't get it to work on any system I've plugged it into. Nonetheless, here's the thing, you might have noticed a little label on the back of this machine. Network General. This company invented the packet sniffer as we know it today. So, now we know where it came from and what it did. Perhaps this unit was used to demonstrate the software. It doesn't appear to be a development system, at least. It's still an intriguing thought. One has to wonder just what it sniffed in its time, if it were used for shady purposes. Like, these tools really do look pretty serious, to be honest. What do you want me to do about it? I didn't set them up. That was someone else. And that's good, because it means we can look at them all these years later. Beyond the packet sniffing weirdness, this is actually the factory operating system installed from Toshiba. So, it's DOS 6.21 with Windows 3.1 and... Hey, hey! <laughs> well, thanks for the heart attack, Krusty. I guess Dave Jones would like this one. He say that's a little bit crusty. Ah, and did I mention those speakers are loud? Yeah, because in fact they're fucking loud. As promised by Toshiba, it does come with things like EasySCSI installed already, which is pretty nice, they weren't lying. 
There isn't much to explore in Windows, and it seems as though Network General never really bothered going in here, to be honest. Given their software ran on DOS, that's hardly surprising. I genuinely have little else to say, because, well, there's nothing to complain about outside the sound system not working well in DOS. But there's nothing too fantastic that we don't already know. We know our way around Windows, and we know our way around DOS, or I would think we would by now. Maybe we don't, maybe we're just completely useless, or maybe it's just me, but yeah, it's uh, there's nothing remarkable about the operation of it, which sounds bad, but that's actually a really good thing, because essentially you just forget that you're using a portable at all, and it feels like you're using a desktop. In fact, it won't feel like anything at all very quickly, at least not below your waist if you've put the system on your lap because of the lack of blood flow. So that's something to bear in mind. All in all, I do like this system and have to wonder if I could hook a Sound Blaster up to the Windows Sound System's line input or CD interface. Internally or externally makes no difference to me as long as it works and as long as it's tidy. Or, at the very least, I wonder if we could hijack its amp and speakers. It should be possible, and I guess I'll have to play with it a bit in the future. I mean, we could just never load the Windows Sound System drivers in DOS, and we'd probably be absolutely fine. Still, that's that, and I'll pass you back to the cameraman now. Oh shit, to think this year's almost over already. It's horrible. Don't get old. Never get old. It sucks. I'm not even old yet, and I already feel it sucks. Uh... It just isn't fun anymore, man. It's just not. But at least I had fun working on this. It took my mind off of it for a little while. What a fucking shame about that audio. Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to say that now anyway. Yeah, that's right, when I fucking cuss, I'm supposed to fucking bleep it out so you can't really tell what I'm saying. It's fucking distracting. It pisses me off. Just grow some balls and stick to what you've said. You know, what are, you, what are they going to do? Fucking say something! Anyway, that audio. It's a fucking letdown. It's a real shame, because everything else about this thing I really like. And it, it's good. They set out what they... They, they did what they set out to achieve. They, it, it does behave like you're carrying a, a 486DX2 desktop around with you. And it's pretty good. But yeah, the usefulness of it is really let down by that Windows sound system. I mean, I guess they weren't lying. Go figure, the Microsoft Windows sound system doesn't work very well in DOS. Thing is, it's supposed to. And the drivers I'm using came with the laptop. Those are the drivers Toshiba supplied, and they don't work. And it, there's no reason it shouldn't, as far as I know. I don't know what the problem is. There's another version of the TSR that should even make it Sound Blaster 16 compatible, which is an unusual feature, and I, I don't know if that's true, because obviously I can't confirm it doesn't work, but I'm told that that version, you lose FM. Yeah, the FM chip doesn't do anything, which makes no sense to me. It's the same damn chip they use on the Sound Blaster, so why wouldn't it work? It's not like it has to emulate anything. It's just stupid if that's the case. But even then, why did these OEMs have to put crappy audio solutions in their portable machines? You know, why couldn't you use creative hardware? Creative are scumbags, they don't let you put it in there in a heartbeat, I'm sure. If you'd call creative up like, hey, can we stuff your shit in our machine? They'd be like, oh, yeah, sure, we can use that, we'll take the fucking money, give it to us. So, I don't know why the hell they didn't use it. And then this, it's not even like there's a power argument. It's like on the Satellite 410, you can argue, ah, oh, well, the ES688 doesn't use a lot of power. And no, it doesn't. And that thing's running on a battery, so, yeah, I guess, you know, you can argue there is a benefit to having it. But, on this, this thing runs on the mains. It doesn't matter how much power you're using, you can stuff a, a better audio solution in there, I'm sure. They just didn't. Yeah, you got a piece of shit instead. I'm not impressed, and I would have to modify this thing to really get much use out of it. And I don't know if I'm willing to, I might end up selling it to be honest, but... Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure yet, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We've looked at the, at the thing anyway, so now we know what it is and what it does, and otherwise it is brilliant, I do really like it. It has some minor problems I need to fix, but I really like it. It's, uh, it's just a shame about that audio. That, that really annoys me. 
Well, I, I, I don't really think I have much anything to say. I'm nothing too eventful. It's uh, it has been an eventful fucking week, but there's nothing you need to know about. It's honestly nothing that important. I mean, I could tell you about it, but it just isn't interesting, so I won't. Uh, that camcorder that we're using, that's fucking going. That's got at most one video left in it. I'm not fucking around with that anymore. It's it's just annoying me. It's, it doesn't work properly. I've never liked it. Time for a replacement. You fucking not easy to find cameras that do NTSC modes. Uh, you used to be able to select that, but even on the professional cameras now, you're limited to whatever mode. And even ones that are in the US are like, oh yeah, the camera's pal. I'm like, fucking why? I don't want to work with a PAL camera. Everything else, nothing else I own outputs PAL, it's all fucking 60 hertz. Everything's digital now, why is this even still a thing? We don't have to adhere to the electrical frequencies anymore. Just give me 60 fucking frames per second. I don't want to sit there and have to fuck about with the oversample, undersample shit in Vegas for hours on end. That is the bulk of editing time, is fucking with the files out of this camera because this camcorder likes to output files that have shit wrong with them and they're all 50 fucking hearts and they're interlaced so then to deinterlace them in rendering takes fucking ages and I, well, I'm sure your camcorder sports but yes it does but the files it puts out are damn near useless. They're fucking huge for some reason. And they tend to lose frames, and I don't know why, it's not like my SD card's not good enough. Fuck that. I'm replacing that camera, and I will find one. I will find one, and I will get one, and I will not have this problem anymore. It's, it's been annoying me for fucking years. The other side, yeah, nothing. I was going to get another synthesizer. Odds are I'm not going to now, because people are assholes, and people are are immature and can't grow the fuck up and discuss things like adults which actually has nothing to do with me getting a synthesizer that just has a thing to do with the fact that people are just shit but yeah uh, evidently I'm starting to lose my temper again so I think I'll just get out of here and I'll, I'll go and smoke myself to death in a corner uh, <laughs> I'll try and get another video done before the end of the year, but I don't know if I can. Depends on, largely on if I manage to get this camcorder replaced. I will not buy a PAL camera, so if I have to fucking wait, if I have to fucking find someone to ship me one over, if I have to fucking go somewhere else to get one, I will. I'm not using PAL cameras anymore. They're just too much fucking trouble. And why the hell it isn't selectable? I'd, I'll have one last rant before I get out of here, because this Sony I use Still, as far as I know, it's advertised as having birth modes, and technically it can, and when it was relatively new, people figured that out, well, it just runs Android, we can run an app on it, and we can toggle it, it's only a software switch, you're like, oh, well, you could update the, no, updating the firmware won't work, the firmware's identical, so, whatever they switch that with, I don't know, but people made an app where you could do it, and I hate that fucking word, it's, it's an applet, and it's just like one dialog box. That comes up. It is to me anyway, but yeah, fucking nor it's an application. Make your damn mind up. Like, which is it? There's, there's no app in my book. But that's what it's fucking called, so that's what we'll call it. And you can select it. And so what does Sony do? Update the firmware. Now you can't do that anymore. I bought mine late on, so my firmware's already updated. So I can't fucking do that with mine. What's the point? The hardware can do it. Why lock it out? Fucking why? You never used to have this problem. You to get even the cheapest shit you would buy from fucking Argos would be 25, 30. Pal, NTSC. It's like, it makes fucking sense. No, not the thing anymore. Not a fucking thing now. Everything, oh, we're going to buy it in Europe. It's 50 fucking hearts. Despite the fact nothing else. Computers don't output 50 hearts. Half my fucking consoles don't output 50 hearts. That, that Sega CD video was such a fucking welcome break from that, because that fucking thing outputs 50 hearts, because it's a European one. I was going to use the fucking Wonder Mega, but the CD drive on it doesn't work anymore. Then. I can fix it. I can fix it. Anyways, as I said, I'm getting out of here. I'm, not, I'm done yelling. You don't need to be yelling at you. Uh, it's not your problem. So yeah, I'm out of here. I'll, I'm going to fix these problems, and I'll see you again later on at some point. Uh, thanks for watching, I'm High Treason. Yeah, as I said, I'll see you around. What a fucking end into the year.
And of course it goes without saying that the BIOS options are quite limited as they tend to be on portable systems and OEM systems. But it does have all the relevant options and relevant information. Such as you can see I do not have the level 2 cache module installed and I can tamper with sound cards and SCSI control and IO ports, the sort of things you'd need to mess with. It's good enough, it serves its purpose. Also you can see that one gigabyte drive limit in effect. Now in all fairness, whilst I'm waiting for a file to load here, the Windows Sound System software is pretty decent. It's not too bad. It's my first experience with it really. It's Mm, I, I can't say I'm the best fan though, because it doesn't seem that well written. It absolutely hammers the CPU, and it seems to go into these weird loops when you load larger files into tools like Quick Recorder. So I don't know what that's about, but yeah, not really as good as MediaVision's software, for example. I figured it was just worth noting, because well, I don't know how many people have played with the Windows Sound System cards or onboard versions. I can't say I'm overly impressed by them, they don't really seem all that great to me, so I probably won't be investing in one of the standalone cards anytime soon. But, uh, well, that's uh, there we go. So, <laughs> that kind of sums it up, really. Now, there are some inherent advantages to not having a battery, such as, well, the machine can be comparatively lighter and smaller. I don't think that's what they were focusing on this, because it's not small or light, really, but it would be a lot larger and heavier if it needed batteries, I would think. So, likely their focus was more on functionality and performance. I mean, if you get rid of these expansion slots, you probably could fit quite a few battery cells in there, it might be enough to run the thing, but... I don't think they're going to last very long. You've got a desktop CPU in there, you've got a power-hungry colour... TFT LCD panel. And yeah, they use quite a lot of power at the time, those things. They get warm. So yeah, you could get a lot more performance. Nowadays, I don't think this applies as much because the technology is comparatively stagnant now, so everything's been shrunk and made more energy efficient than really it probably has any need to be. So if you get a battery-powered laptop now, you're going to get comparatively good performance to a desktop, you know, especially if you want to pay for a, a good one. Whereas back then the technology was accelerating very fast, we were pretty much doubling the performance on the CPU every year for a few years and well the technology wasn't shrinking fast enough to keep up, hence the first generation Pentium which is a very hot running thing. And the 486 even, it does get warm and so yeah if you wanted to put batteries in here you'd have to start getting rid of these things. Nowadays I don't think it's as much a problem, although, with no battery, it's probably going to be a lot easier to get on aeroplanes and such. A lot of places don't like you taking volatile battery cells in, you don't want to bring lithium polymer batteries around certain areas. Not really a good idea. We don't have that problem with this. Of course, in its time they would have likely used NICAD cells, which I actually prefer, and we've seen what those can do when we've looked at Zenith machines that use extremely good cells, those things can do 30 something years and still work like they just left the factory, it's absolutely phenomenal, it's a shame they're outlawed in this country, except for medical equipment, yeah it tells you something that they still use them exclusively there doesn't it, for things that save people's lives, yeah, it might be telling you something, strange how times change, it's quite scary really to think I was already on the planet when this thing was built, and it seems like a very long time ago now. <laughs> It's, it's scary, I don't like it anymore. <laughs>